Welcome, everyone. We're so pleased to see you in this remote context and welcome you to this event. I'm Joy Connolly, the president of the American Council of Learned Societies, and I'm delighted to have you here in our virtual Zoom room. We're so pleased to gather an impressive group of scholars and funders for this conversation, moderated by Professor Richard Powell, professor at Duke University and a member of the ACLS Board of Directors. So I'm especially pleased and grateful to have him here. This event is part of an ongoing series of anti-racism discussions that was developed through meetings with a large group of fellows, society readers, and consortium contacts. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about this event in a moment. Let me take a step back briefly and say that uh, by way of framing this discussion that ACLS has always been committed, uh, certainly in recent decades, to a diverse academy and events of the last year, 18 months, um, have only accelerated that interest and I would say transformed a principle and, and belief and commitment ever more urgently into concrete action. In the summer of 2020, in response to the pandemic, we established a new fellowship program uh, supported by our endowment and with the enthusiastic support of our board of directors. This fellowship program was for recent PhDs. We call it the Emerging Voices Fellowship and its winners in the first cohort announced late last summer were over 50% a Black or Latinx scholars. Uh, we, we recently welcomed also eight new HBCU members to our associates network, as well as 11 new HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution members to that network. That brings our total minority serving institution representation in that network to 27 schools. The number grows by the day, we're proud to say, and now represents over 10% of that group, and we want it to grow to grow larger. Uh, the voices of HBCU and HSI leaders and faculty and graduate students are enormously important to our continued work in fostering inclusive excellence and supporting scholars of color. Now, I am going to say one word briefly about this event. Uh, late last or middle of last fall, we uh, had a wonderful event uh, discussing race and racism and the contributions of humanistic scholarship to the Academy. And it was uh, Khalil Mohammed and Bianca Williams, two, uh, two uh, participants in that panel, Professor Mohammed from Harvard, uh, Professor Williams from the City University of New York Graduate Center, um, who raised the question of the role of philanthropy in advancing and supporting scholars of color and specifically uh, black scholars in the United States. Philanthropy, philanthropy clearly plays an enormously important role in the work of, of advancement, lifting up, highlighting, spotlighting, and advocacy, as our panelists noted. And they're pointed questions to us about uh, our role at ACLS in convening and advancing those conversations and making them public uh, and accessible was the main driver of setting up this panel. Now, I'm pleased to introduce Rick, Dr. Powell, Professor Powell, as our moderator. Um, Rick, as we call him, has taught at Duke University since 1989, and he now serves as John Spencer Bassett Professor of Art and Art History at Duke. He served, he studied, excuse me, he studied at Morehouse College and Howard University before earning his doctorate at Yale. And along now with teaching courses in American art and the arts of the African diaspora and contemporary visual studies, He's written extensively on topics ranging from primitivism to postmodernism, and his books include, uh, I'll just name some of the work, um, Homecoming, The Art and Life of William H. Johnson, Black Art, A Cultural History, appearing first in 1997 and again uh, in a new edition in 2002, and Cutting a Figure, Fashioning Black Portraiture, which appeared in 2008. His newest book published late last year is Going There, Black visual satire. He's also among the esteemed commentators featured in the new HBO documentary, Black Art in the Absence of Light. So thank you, Rick, for agreeing to moderate this panel. Thank you all in advance to the panelists for your time and wisdom uh, and sharing it with us and with the audience today. And thank you members of the audience for carving out time in what I know are crazy schedules for all uh, in tackling with us the important questions uh, that Rick will moderate. Again, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Joy. 
and uh, welcome everyone to this panel, Forward Looking Philanthropy, a virtual conversation among funders and black scholars. And I'd like to in particular welcome our very distinguished panel, Cal Alston, Professor and Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Syracuse University. Randy C. Bremer, Associate Professor of History, Spelman College. Andrew Del Banco, President of the Teagle Foundation. Adam F. Falk, President of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Dory Gilbert, Dean of Arts and Sciences and Dean of Graduate Studies, Prairie View a and University. Dwight A. McBride, President of the New School. And Naila Suad Nasir, President of the Spencer Foundation. So we have a lot of ground to cover. And I thought that as part of my introduction, I would answer one of the questions that I'm about to ask everyone on this panel. Can you think back to that initial grant that you got? that was really transformative. And for me, it was a grant that I got right out, right out of Howard University. I received a Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship Grant in museum education, which took me from Washington DC to New York. It put me in touch with folks like Mary Schmidt Campbell at the Studio Museum in Harlem, Lowry Stokes Sims at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Bob Blackburn at the Printmaking Workshop, Linda Good Bryant, at just above Midtown Gallery. In other words, it really transformed me. It broadened my vistas and views on the world, on my profession. And it really took me on a path that was really, really quite significant. And I think that what we're gonna be doing today is looking at the idea of philanthropy as something that can move people forward, not just forward looking philanthropy, but a philanthropy that actually propels and encourages scholars to move into areas that perhaps they had not thought about moving into to before. So what I'd like to do is, is, first of all, give everyone a chance to do that recollection themselves. Uh, perhaps we can start in alphabetical order. Um, uh, Professor um, uh, uh, Alston, could you please tell us a little bit about um, that, that first transformative fellowship? Or grant. Um, like, like a good philosopher, I'm gonna answer the question you gave me and then I'm gonna answer a different question that you didn't ask. Um, the first one is from a Spencer Foundation. Like you, uh, as, a, as a new professor, I got, I got uh, a Spencer Foundation um, fellowship and it was, it was very transformative because it provided an interruption in the kind of um, ongoing pressure of day-to-day -day activities that you do on the tenure track in a large R1 institution and allowed me to really reconceptualize what I wanted to be doing in the next five years, not what I had been doing. But I also um, now am more in the grant uh, reception on behalf of organizations. And so I'm the chair of the National Advisory Board and, uh, for Imagining America and co-PI for our Mellon found funded project on transforming higher education to support engaged scholars. And so both of those, I think, give, have given me an opportunity to, as you said, network with so many people outside of my uh, uh, natural habitat, my discipline, my uh, geographic location. And I think those things have been really important. Thank you, Professor Alston. Uh, Professor Brimmer. Thank you. So this moment came for me when I was finishing up my dissertation at UCLA and um, I received a pre-doc at uh, the University of Notre Dame in the context of the Erskine Peters Fellowship. Um, and I wanna be specific here because um, it, it would set the stage later for the postdoctoral fellowship from the Ford Foundation. So I wanna shout out the Ford Foundation, but it was in this environment at uh, the University of Notre Dame that I was able to socialize with a young energetic faculty, um, emerging faculty thinking about institutionalizing black studies at Notre Dame. But the fellowship also brought a cohort of 
emerging scholars to the campus. And that for me, that, that cohort experience was really transformational. And so that moment for me made it possible for me to not only think that I could finish this, this project, but also do, do so and move forward in a cohort of, of interdisciplinary emerging scholars. Thank you. Uh, president Del Banco. My goodness, I'm not used to be called president, but thank you. Um, so, you know, this question pushes me back in memory uh, quite a few more years than it does for professors Alston and Brimmer. And the only good thing of, about having to think back that far is it means um, you get a little closer to the front of the line to getting a vaccine uh, due to your age. Um, so I, I was very struck actually by what Professor Brimmer just said. Um, if I, because by contrast, if I reconstruct uh, my experience in receiving that first fellowship, which actually came from ACLS, it, it felt like a validation from the outside. I was in the junior faculty at Harvard at the time, but it also felt like a confirmation that my job was to do essentially solitary scholarship. It did not have for me the aspect that Professor Brimmer was just speaking about, uh, work, becoming introduced to a new cohort, learning from others. And, and so when I think back of it, on it re retrospectively, I miss that dimension. And I suspect that that's one of the ways in which uh, the experience um, may, may, have, may have changed over the years. The other thing I have to say, thinking back to that era, is that, <clears throat> My impression was then that this kind of fellowship tended to go toward people who already had a lot of advantages. I was in an elite institution and there was a generous leave policy. There was a manageable teaching load. And so this, this fellowship came in and it basically said, all right, you know, you got even more time to do the things that you wanna do. And of course I appreciated that at the time, but now that I sit in a different place, it seems to me that uh, philanthropy needs to think about uh, whether it directs its resources to people who already have advantages and whether it might not be better to spend our resources on people who need them more. So thank you. Thank you. President Falk. So uh, I may echo, echo a few of the things that people have said. I'll say my field actually unusual in this panel is that back when I did this is high energy theoretical physics. So I was getting uh, funding in different sorts of places. Um, and of course, eligible for, for government funding, but the um, from the National Science Foundation. But the, the the grant that meant the most to me early, right at the beginning of my career, was actually a Sloan Research Fellowship from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which I I happens to be what I run now, and that is a a, a grant given to young faculty, unrestricted money, uh, and. It had the uh, same effect that many of you are talking about, some freedom to, to network, to get out there, to go to conferences. But I think for me, it was the psychological effect that was the most important, that it, it really told me a young faculty member that I belonged in the institution, that I belonged in the field. And now at the Sloan Foundation, we're very aware of that psychological effect, that validating effect for young faculty to get an SRF. And I, I think that is as important, and we're told that, as important as the money itself. Thank you. Dean Gilbert. My first funding was a little over 20 years ago as a new junior faculty in a large research one majority serving institution. And the funding source was a minority supplement grant attached to a larger National Institute of Mental Health parent grant. It's now called a diversity supplement grant. And that's important in terms of the name. Um, this was a great value to me as an underrepresented researcher. And it certainly jump-started my research agenda. It um, transformed me um, in terms of having exposure to top-rate researchers at the University of California at San Francisco. And it was quite um, meaningful to me uh, in my career. However, in looking back on it now, um, I recognize certainly the unintended message uh, as a junior researcher uh, about uh, the, the narrow, possibly predefined space for scholars of, of color 
uh, to speak to seek out funding and and so I am conscious now of the name of what we call certain funding sources and and I can uh, recognize that it may be the beginning of junior researchers of color asking, where does my work fit in the big world of, of funding? Sort of the psychological impact that Adam just spoke to. Thank you. President McBride. So yeah, I, I echo a lot of what everyone else has said. My first really two, I guess, examples of uh, early career funding were uh, the UC President's Postdoctoral Fellowship and an NEH, a National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, Summer Stipend. And both of those came very early on in my career, my first or first and second year uh, as an assistant professor, um, really critically important to launching a career. Um, and I think gave me a, a huge head start in terms of really launching my scholarly project, the, the primary project. But to the point that you made, um, Professor Powell, it also allowed me the freedom to be able to explore a secondary um, area of scholarship, which was not primary for me at the time, that ultimately ended up being something that was a huge part of my career. So it was during that same period that I uh, was able to work on a book on James Baldwin, um, which was important to me for different reasons, and, uh, and then um, publish an essay um, that became in, on broadly um, on the topic of looking at the intersection of race and sexuality that between the two of those things really became a, an enormous part of my scholarly profile that I had not anticipated. So if, I think without the time early on in my career, um, I probably would not uh, have been able to have that opportunity. Thank you. President Nasir. Yes, um, I would echo what many of my colleagues on the panel have said. And Cal, for me, it was also the Spencer Postdoctoral Fellowship. <laughs> so, and what I remember most about that, two things. One, the same thing that Adam and others have said, that it signaled for me that I was a scholar, like for real. And two, that I... <laughs> There's the official story. It allowed me to you know, begin to explore this new line of work around identity that became really instrumental to my career. But I also recall being in a van headed to the airport with a group of the other scholars. And we were having the informal conversation, like, what are you doing with your extra time? And people said things like, you know, hanging out with my kids. Like I'm, you know, I, I actually <laughs> so I say I have half of a half of a degree in in um, as a massage therapist. I did that that year, and I say that just to say part of it for for that cohort at least at that time was to make space for us to also be whole human people and to think about the the, the rest of our lives as well. In addition, of course, to how it supported our um, our scholarly trajectories. But I think I want to make sure that's on the table that there's also the part of philanthropic support that's about creating a life in the academy that's sustainable where there's space kind of for, for all of you. Thank you. Um, this has been really revelatory. Um, your personal stories about uh, initial funding and then how, how it transformed you. Now I'd like to shift a little bit towards the scholars. Well, all of you are scholars, but those of you who are really holding up that banner um, today. Uh, Professor Alston and Professor Bremer, as well as Dean Gilbert and, and President McBride. If, if you all could speak to perhaps um, the barriers that, that, that continue to be present as, um, as, as scholars you know, work their way through you know, the world of, of, of funding and, and philanthropy. I can start. And I want to just, again, it's already been laid out in my introduction, but I'm really sort of approaching this not only as a graduate um, from a HBCU, but also a historian um, actively working at a HBCU. And also to say that my work at HBCU has, has um, goes beyond working at Spelman College. I spent a lot of time at, at Morgan State. It's within that context um, and achieving tenure uh, within this context that faculty development is just so crucial to this question from my perspective. And when I say that, I mean specifically things that perhaps if I was at uh, where I started at a, 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 a private prominent um, institution in the South, these things just aren't available um, all the time or they are, they're, they're um, at a much, to a much lesser extent, support for research. 
the ability to go to conferences. I mean, things that people might take, scholars might take for granted, support for writing groups, the ability to create the very cohort sense that I was talking about that I had when I was at the University of Notre Dame. Um, so, so initiatives that support the very production of knowledge um, that, not, not, that it's, not that it's not held up at these institutions, it's certainly valued, um, but, but there's definitely a gap, certainly even at the associate professor level, uh, what the options are at the institutional level. And so I think in that sense, foundations and, and funders can be really important um, helping um, support faculty in that way. Thank you. Um, Cal, or yes, yeah. please. I, I wanna uh, totally endorse everything uh, that Professor Brimmer said. I think I was the PI for our NSF Advance project. And one of the parts of our project was about building social networks for women in STEM. But I see that same absence for our um, scholars of color and particularly in, in going after um, foundation funding that's not tied to a fellowship, that is tied to a sort of a bigger project. You need to have a community in which you can develop a prospectus and a proposal. And I think it would be, I think it's important for us to nurture those networks across kinds of institutions, across uh, I'm an interdisciplinary scholar, so I always think interdisciplinarily. I would hope that that foundations can help to fill that gap because it's not always viewed in institutional um, research offices that that's the most important thing. But I do think it's crucial. Thank you. Um, Dwight or Dory, would you like to add to, to that? I completely um, echo everything that um, uh, that my two colleagues have already said. I, when I think about the question of barriers, I guess the first thing though that came to mind for me were more of the kind of institutional barriers. And so I'd like to speak very briefly to, to some of those. And I think the biggest thing for me is that I feel like we need to have more intentionality around what it is to support black scholars, right? If that is our goal, I think as funders, we need to also just think in more intentional ways. By that, I mean, we need certainly to have more uh, black people in positions uh, in the context of foundations and positions of leadership as program officers, et cetera. And we've seen, readily seen of late in the last few years that when that happens, it really does make an appreciable difference. So we've, we have evidence of that. Um, the need for, I think, regular forums or mechanisms for leaders and program officers of foundations to hear the experiences of black scholars, particularly young, young or in earlier career black scholars, um, because I do think it makes an absolute difference. How you start um, really does um, have a, a, an impact on how a career trajectory ends up uh, going in many cases. It's not to say that one can't overcome difficult circumstances, but it certainly is a whole lot more advantageous if you have the kind of mentoring up front and the kinds of opportunities for time and reflection and research um, that um, that's critical. I think in those early uh, in those early career uh, years, especially, and I think um, the need for intentional training to that point of graduate students um, and postdocs uh, in those uh, early careers, so that they understand what the funding opportunities are. Um, one of the things that I, I feel really fortunate, I had advisors who happened to, but again, it just, it happened to be the case um, that they were folks who cared a lot about not only my intellectual growth, but they also made sure that they prepared me for the profession. And I think that more attention to that um, and, and that can't just be, you know, by luck of the draw about which advisor you get. I think there are institutionally things we can do. There are uh, add-ons to funding that uh, foundations already give that might be possible to create those kinds of um, mentoring moments. Um, similar to what Cal was saying, the idea of even cross-institutional opportunities to do that. Uh, if you happen to be in a place where there aren't a whole lot of other people who are like you and doing the work that you do. So that's the way I think about some of the, the barriers I think we need to be, continue to be really thoughtful about. Thank you, Dory. I think you uh, 
are ready to say something. Yeah, so I just want to pick up on um, Dwight's uh, comment about intentionality. And so uh, from an HBCU perspective, echo again what's already been said about sometimes the lack of resources at HBCUs, comparatively speaking. Faculty are teaching more courses, carrying heavier loads, and sometimes have limited time to write grants and such. And so that intentionality is, is very important um, with uh, funding scholars at HBCUs. And I've had the, um, the fortune of being able to speak uh, with my faculty members and they have some very uh, concrete ideas about how we can move forward with that. Having uh, more summer research grants and semester long course uh, release grants, fellowships that uh, bring scholars from uh, diverse institutions together for book projects and also semester long HBCU faculty exchange programs with other institutions with well-established humanities research centers. And so I think that's more of, of what's already been said, but I think uh, intentionality is important and uh, reaching out uh, with the proper um, mechanisms and, and communication to HBCU uh, scholars of color is very important. Thank you. I want to kind of ask this question similarly to um, our funders. Um, what, what do foundations see as, as barriers and how might uh, they be removed? Um, Adam, um, Naila, Andrew? I might say, say something. I, mean, so I, I, I think the conversation we've had so far is about some really important dynamics. And, uh, but rather, and I, I think particularly this Dory's comment about intentionality is, is, is really important, and of course, mentorship. But just for fun, I'm gonna talk about a different sort of barrier, uh, which I see very much from the foundation point, grant-making point of view. And, uh, and that comes from the fact that foundations actually don't have a lot of money to give away. I mean, it seems like a lot of money, but they tend, we certainly at the Sloan Foundation, tend to define our programs pretty rigidly so that we can have an impact in the area in which we're making grants. And that very rigidity can be a real barrier for um, supporting, for broadening the, the, the communities into which we make those grants, for, for, for supporting faculty of color, for uh, engaging with issues that are important to communities of color. So I'll give you a real quick example, is that we have at the Sloan Foundation a program in energy in the environment, which is really about energy economics. And you'll not be shocked to know that that was not a program with a very diverse set of grantees in it over the last few years. Last year, we made the decision to bring under the umbrella of that program, a new sub area of distributional equity in the clean energy transition. And what turns out is two things. One is all of a sudden, we are open to making grants in a wide variety of areas where people were studying communities of color and the impact of the energy transition on those communities. And that we had in our recent call for proposals, many more investigators of color, many more black scholars working in that area interested in studying that. So that programmatic shift, that deliberately opening up into an area where we knew there were gonna be more scholars of color studying issues of importance to communities of color uh, was really key for us. And I think foundations have to be intentional about getting past their own programmatic boundaries if they want to broaden who it is that they're funding. Yeah, I want to I want to um, add to that because I think that's a, that's exactly right, Adam. There are th there are ways we think about our fields. There are ways we're set up structurally. There are ways that we operate that are kind of second nature to, to philanthropy that actually are themselves barriers. And so I do think the intentionality and the willingness to be self-critical for foundations is really important in how you open up those opportunities. I will say that for us at Spencer, one of the things, one of the moves we've tried to make in that space is we have long had a practice of providing feedback only to proposals that made it to, our, to the kind of the end of our process. So we were providing feedback to the kind of top 30% of proposals, but that meant if you sent a proposal to us for a research project and you didn't make it to that final round, you actually had no idea why. And, and we made the decision about 18 months ago to provide feedback to anyone who, who sends us a proposal that's viable in part because um, 
we came to see our role, not just as deciding who's worthy of funding or not, but as a part of this ecology that's supposed to be mentoring and supporting the growth in capacity and skill and knowledge of the field. And, and, and in some ways that's one small move towards disrupting the ways in which our um, foundation funding is very much influenced by your networks. Do you know someone who's gotten a grant and have you asked them for a copy of their proposal so that you can mirror the structure? And, and so um, I think all the ways that we can disrupt information happening through social networks and actually make information available to, to potential grantees feels um, really important as a way to remove barriers and diversifying our own staff, our own process, how, how proposals are reviewed and vetted internally is also really important and being data-driven about that. Are you looking at who you're funding systematically as a part of your decision process? Are you transparent about who you're funding and who you're not funding? And, and, and to whom are you accountable for those patterns? Thank you. So um, <clears throat> I, I should probably take a, a quick moment before trying to answer the barrier question <clears throat> to say that the foundation I represent, the Teagle Foundation, is a little different, I think, from the other organizations uh, represented here. We do not explicitly make grants to scholars. Our focus is on students, specifically undergraduate students. Now, what that means to me in the context of this conversation is that our critical partners are scholar teachers. That is, they, without them, we can't reach the undergraduate students. And I think of the teacher-student relationship as a mutually educational one. So we think we do support scholars, but not in quite the same way as you know, giving a research grant to a scholar to take time away from his or her teaching. So that said, if you ask me about the barriers we're facing right now, well, I think they're probably well known to all of you. Um, students are, are in a mental health crisis, uh, particularly students who have faced this new virtual world of education without adequate uh, IT equipment or internet connectivity. So one of the ways we've tried in our very, and as Adam says, we don't at the end of the day have much money. We've made grants to institutions like uh, Rutgers Newark, Rutgers Camden, CUNY, all of which were in an emergency situation with thousands of students who were being asked to continue their education uh, with inadequate uh, internet or reluctant to allow uh, the outside world into their homes because they didn't want their domestic situation to be revealed to strangers. So those are the kinds of problems that our students are facing. Faculty are exhausted. Faculty are intimidated by the situation they find themselves in. Uh, many of them are heroic and creative nevertheless. But so I guess I would say that one of the things we're up against right now is a short, a sh we hope, a short-term emergency which brings with it short-term thinking. And we're trying to encourage longer-term thinking, thinking, thinking outside the box. Um, one other, and, and some of the things I've said, this has been alluded to in other people's comments, young women faculty in particular, who are burdened with childcare responsibilities without institutional support. So it's a, it's a the, the list of barriers is a very long one right now. You all know that. Uh, on, the, on the positive side, our mission is to support uh, liberal education. That's not everybody's favorite term, broad, humanistic, mind-opening, heart-transforming education. Perhaps I could call it that. Uh, there are a lot of challenges right now in the, in the face of those who believe in that sort of education, as I don't need to say. Uh, there's been the stampede towards STEM, much of which is understandable and valuable, but making the case for the humanities right now is a challenge. So that's something we have to do all the time as best we can. And something I find myself saying, I try not to be too long-winded, I apologize. The crisis is obvious, but there are also some opportunities, which are the other side of the coin. The COVID crisis is a, is a public health crisis, it's an economic crisis, but it's also a values crisis. It has revealed, some people didn't need the revelation, but some people did. It has revealed the inequities in our society. We know that this 
disease has struck disproportionately uh, African Americans and other minorities and low income Americans. So there's a values crisis that we need to be able to think about uh, together. The explicit anti-black violence that we saw in 2020 and what perhaps might be called the implicit anti-black violence that we saw in other contexts more recently have woken some Americans who were a little bit asleep at the wheel up to the realities of our history. So there are opportunities for humanistic scholar teachers uh, that are, are urgent, that need to be seized right now in this context. And we're trying to figure out ways to be helpful to those who want to seize them. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I want to give all of you an opportunity to talk to one another. <laughs> and so I, I, I want to be a little bit more informal in this next, in the final moments before we switch over to uh, Q&A. But, but, but I want you to hopefully keep in mind something that um, our, the title of our panel really makes clear, forward looking. And when I think about forward looking, I'm thinking about um, Andrew, those students that you talked about at the beginning of your comments, that these are going to be our future scholars um, who will be applying for grants, who will be creating new research. So I was hoping that in this general conversation amongst ourselves, if you could speak a little bit about the advice that you might offer um, these, these up and coming um, future um, or junior scholars as they begin to face this, this new world that we, that, that we will be experiencing literally um, in, in months to come with this kind of return to uh, interacting and traveling and doing research in libraries, et cetera. So I just open that up to, to everyone and, and please feel free to, to interject and, and keep your, your, your comments kind of brief so that other people can, can share as well. We did, we did come back to the, the title addressing black scholars and philanthropy. And so I a little bit wanted to answer back to Andrew that it's not just students who are having a mental health crisis their black scholars have been having, uh, you know, lots of uh, balancing issues all along, um, but uh, exacerbated by the by recent what we've undergone in the last year. And so uh, I really am interested in um, when we say going forward. I've been teaching a class on the inequities of COVID this semester. And the word we have decided to ban from the room is returning to normal, normal. Normality wasn't all it was cracked up to be to begin with. So we want to start with some other word. And so I, I a little bit want to ask my, my friends and colleagues on the panel, what does it look to look forward and what do we have to change in our mindset and our uh, directionality to propel ourselves that way? For me, at some level, it's too early to give, you know, to credit the pandemic with, with things because I'm still, you know what I mean? But that said, we have all been a part of this grand forced experiment um, that has been caused by this pandemic. And it would be irresponsible, I think, almost as leaders not to be thinking about what, we what we've learned from this moment that we will take forward into building, to borrow a phrase, building back better, right? Um, because um, we're not, uh, you're absolutely right. What I think this has also pointed out to, to talk to Andrew, uh, to, to respond to Andrew's comment that he made, it's not only pointed out the inequities um, that are in our society, but the ones that were there, that have always been there. They've really it's shined an incredible light on them. And it's done the same in the context of our institutions, to your point. Um, and so I think one of the things I want to be focused on in, a, in an almost laser-like way is to think about even how we return to campuses this fall as, as you know, people are beginning to make announcements, et cetera. And I'm speaking only in the academic context for the moment. As we return to, I want to also keep that same experimental mindset, right? That is, I want to continue to understand the fall and spring of this coming year as a kind of part or continuation of that experiment, because we're going to see even the return differently because of the lens of the experience that we've all had. And I think there is a recognition 
that the way things were even on our campuses before were not equitable for everyone. And so I think if we if we keep an experimental mindset coming out of this, going into what uh, will be um, this new normal for us as we begin to build it and develop it together, I think there's a real opportunity here for us um, to, through some of those lessons learned, to really um, be more, to go back to a term we've also used today, to be more intentional about the choices that we'll make as we build together that new normal uh, in our institutional contexts. Thank you. Naila. Yeah, I'm struck by your, your comment, Cal, is it, what does it mean to move forward? And I always think about this in, in relation to what does it mean to inch forward? <laughs> and what does it mean, to, which means to me making things slightly better, but keeping the foundations of our systems the same? And what does it mean to really reimagine for true kind of long-term forward movement? And I don't know that we know how to do that, that second thing very well. And so when I think about philanthropy and, and, and funding and availability of funding, the inching forward is what we know how to do, but fundamentally philanthropy itself is an elitist kind of white supremacist exercise, right? Like <laughs> foundations start because some very wealthy person sets aside a big pot of money into a tax shelter and then decides where it should go. So one could argue, and people have argued, that actually that money should, shouldn't be tax sheltered at all. It should be back into the public systems and then create systems that are going to support. So, so there's a, it depends on what scale we're talking about that forward movement. I think we can, you know, as a, as a foundation leader, we're, we're in a system with certain parameters. And I, I think that we have to work really hard to disrupt some of the ways that elitism plays out and, and think about access and availability and funding cutting edge fields that tend not to get funded and thinking carefully about the institution the scholars are from that we're funding and, and, and funding black scholars. Um, and we need to be thinking about what's the mechanism and the structures that we need kind of longer term going forward. Thank you, Brandy. I I saw you nodding and I was, I was anxious to hear what you had to say about the particular junior scholars um, who are moving um, up uh, and the like. Well, I was nodding because I, I was sketching out sort of taking notes on what everybody was saying and then uh, Naila has completely blown up what I was gonna say, which is <laughs> really important. Um, but as, as, a, as a black scholar working at a black institution, I think it's really important to see HBCUs as important sites of knowledge production. Um, black scholars working in these environments realize this, but when it comes to uh, building relationships with foundations, it doesn't always work like that. I've oftentimes had experiences, not only at Spelman, but also when I was at Morgan State, that I was certainly um, invited to participate in particular prog programmatic initiatives after the plan had been sketched out. And so I think in moving forward, since we've opened this conversation up, it's really important to bring uh, black faculty working at black majority institutions to the table at the planning phase. And so I think um, the earlier conversation around rigidly defined program initiatives, bringing these voices to the table at those stages uh, might create something, something new. Thank you. Dean Dory Gilbert, um, yes. how do you do that? <laughs> I, I, I will add to that. Of course, you know, um, speaking of the obvious that, you know, black scholars are not a monolithic group, but um, at the same time, um, although we have gone through so much uh, in this last 18 months, um, COVID, uh, virtual environments, but, you know, we've also gone through a major racial reckoning in, in our nation. And so I believe that that's, you know, part of uh, why we're here having, having this conversation now. And so I think that it will be important to bring uh, Black scholars at HBCU um, institutions to uh, uncover the breadth and depth of what they are studying and uh, what they will have to add to um, the knowledge base and, and the discourse. And so uh, I think that part's very important, although it, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly what topic areas 
are absent or would be definitively added once we hear from a collective group of Black scholar voices. Uh, but, um, at, and we don't want to presume we know, but at the same time, um, it sounds like the inching may be about having a call, uh, even with limited resources of funding, right? But, but making that call to collect and examine uh, what areas are of particularly uh, particular importance right now for, for Black scholars. What are we missing, particularly around areas of social justice right now? And so that, that has to be uh, part of the conversation, I think. Thank you. Adam and Andrew, I'd be really curious to hear from you related to what um, Dory just said about where you see um, the world of philanthropy um, moving uh, in the future as related to these scholars who are <laughs> moving with you. Well, if I could say something very brief and I think simple and probably obvious about that, um, it's time that we, we, most of us probably do, but it's time that the public at large understand better. The world of higher education is, is stratified in much the same way as a broader society is. The inequities in, in terms of institutional resources are staggering and outrageous. So you have a small number of institutions that command an in immensely large fraction of the overall wealth. And the institutions that are educating most young people, particularly first generation college students, students of color, immigrant students, uh, are struggling with woefully inadequate resources. And that's a fact of life that I think most of the public doesn't understand. Uh, and one of the things we ought to do, I think, as educators is to help, help the country understand that better. I mean, what kind of a country are we living in when some institutions can spend north of $100,000 per year per student, whereas a community college can spend maybe twelve dollars or $15,000 per student? Is that, is that just justice? Is that the country we want to be living in? We should at least be explicit about it. Maybe some people would say, yeah, that's fine, but they should know what they're endorsing when they, when they say that. So that's just, I just want to put that out there as a, as a, as a premise that we ought to have in mind as we think about how to distribute the resources we have for, and I take President Nasir's comment much to heart. Right now, there are these philanthropic private dollars that were acquired by all kinds of dastardly means. And those of us who are running foundations have something to say about how they get spent. Maybe that's not the best way to organize things. And maybe in years from now, it'll be different. But right now, that's how it is. I'd like to just connect some observations that Naila and Dory made. I mean, Naila talked about networks and the importance that they play on the ground in sourcing grantees for foundations. And, and um, uh, Dwight mentioned intentionality and Dory mentioned the importance of HBCUs. And I would kind of want to pull that all together and say something about how I think foundations need to think differently about how they are more intentional about the networks that they use to source grantees. I mean, it's very easy to sit at a foundation and think that all these pieces of paper that come over the transom with proposals on them had the same resources behind them, came out of the same context, that's just not true. And so engaging with scholars and understanding the, the this is also something that's come out of the, the pandemic, kind of understanding the reality of the conditions under which people have had to do that work, engaging with a wider diversity of institutions, particularly minority serving institutions, HBCUs, and understanding the challenge of the lack of support because of lack of resources that many of those scholars might have, including intentionally those institutions and those scholars in those networks is I think absolutely essential work for foundations to do and then broadcasting clearly their commitments in that direction. So we just put on our website as it happens, a very prominent commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion statement. And one of the commitments that we make is to be intentional about trying to find more opportunities to make grants to minority serving institutions. And we say it, and I think it's important to say it because otherwise those networks don't grow in the ways that we need them to.
Yeah. I just want to go back to reflect a little bit on what Dory said about n we're not all monolith. And I think that's true. As a humanities person, I though do want to sort of reflect on the history of when, when um, uh, we admit more women or wh whoever the down group is into a professional space, then that space gets degraded. It happened with medicine. It happened, you know, all of these spaces. And I do not, I see a collision of the degrading of humanities with more and more students who really are engaged in these philosophical questions, these literary questions, these historical questions that matter in how we organize all of the questions we've been asking here to me are philosophical in nature and have an ethical tinge to them. And I wanna encourage more black students to engage with them and I don't want us to discourage their inquiry by putting up structural barriers to that. So that, that's just my like uh, pitch for the humanistic studies um, going forward. Any um, thoughts that anyone might have before we um, entertain some questions from um, our vast audience out there? I just want to say that it's really, I think this is really an important moment for us in philanthropy and as um, people in universities to, to, as Dwight talked about, to really open ourselves to the change that we, that is, that is, um, that is in our midst. I've seen more kind of commitments to racial equity coming out of the foundation world this year than I'd seen in, in my prior, you know, three or four years in philanthropy. I've seen people be more willing to explicitly call out what their goals are around diversifying grantees, around funding black led organizations, around funding black scholars. And so I guess I just wanna call out that I'm hopeful around that, that direction and wanna ensure that we're continuing to move ourselves in um, more and more progressive and visionary um, ways that speak to possibility. Thank you. Well, I think at this point, I'd like to bring uh, Joy Connolly back to um, look at some of the questions that the public uh, uh, has for us. Joy. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I hope everyone can see me. Uh, I am much appreciate the, the lively conversation and honest conversation about these um, never easy uh, topics of, dis of, of discussion. And Rick, thank you for a terrific job moderating. I'm, I'm gonna leap right into um, a difficult question, knowing that all of you are willing to tackle them. And that is, and I'm distilling a few questions that have come up and there are many questions. Uh, thank you audience, keep them coming, but no, we, we won't be able to answer all of them in the short time we have left. But, um, but I'm distilling the essence of a few and I'll ask this, that you know, whether, uh, and, and this is really primarily for uh, for the funders on the panel, but I encourage the scholars to weigh in with their thoughts and advice too. Whether you're designing programs and doing RFPs, um, uh, calls for proposals, or if you're running individual fellowship and grants programs, um, a consistent concern for applicants, and we know this from ACLS, I see it in the, in the Q&A here, is how are we thinking about um, dealing with honestly taking into account as we design programs or make decisions about individual uh, applications how do we take into account the conditions of work whether that be um, extensive teaching responsibilities or mentoring responsibilities especially for faculty at hbcus uh, although not only there but but that's something uh, a topic i've been exploring a lot this year uh, and, and and a set of challenges we've been thinking about at acls how do we uh, how are we thinking internally uh, about how to manage um, the, I suppose, let me just say for the purpose of simplicity, uh, the, the older way of looking at proposals in the abstract, a little bit like uh, new criticism, you know, the words on the page, not really taking uh, context into account. Uh, how are we balancing uh, the, the whole scholar to go back uh, to something that was said in the very beginning and the considerations of life and work that are part of the human experience of every applicant or everyone putting forward an RFP. Are, are you thinking about this as you shape your programs? Are you thinking about this as you advise your evaluators? How is consideration of life conditions and identity going into your thinking about your programming? 
as someone, not as a funder, but as someone who sat on a lot of panels and um, who has um, uh, made a lot of applications, I don't think anyone's ever asked, right? I mean, so part of what I think is really important is, I mean, going back to the, the question of intentionality is to really to ask about as a part of the granting application, the conditions of your work, ask about the teaching load, ask about the kind of leave time that you've had available or not had available, et cetera. Um, I think understanding those conditions and even, I mean, you know, um, I think one could even optionally, uh, if one wanted to ask about the conditions of one's family conditions, you know, I mean, have you, has this been a time in which um, as a woman, you might have actually um, given childbirth and had other kinds of responsibilities and duties, et cetera, that, that don't get accounted for in these kinds of evaluations. I feel like we do more of that, in, at least in places I've been, we do more of it when we look at graduate student applications, PhD applications. We become slightly better about it, um, and there's more training around it. I feel like if we could get to a place where we were doing a bit more of that more intentionally, or even thinking about um, ways in which if we're committed to granting across institutional types, even thinking about the difference between a liberal arts university or someone who may be at a large research university with different kinds of resources and different kinds of teaching loads, et cetera. So I think just more intentionality in that regard. Yeah, if I could just jump in. I mean, as I said earlier, <clears throat> we're in a little bit of a different place. because we, we don't look at, say, book proposals and look at them in the way that Joy suggested as a sort of new critic or blanking out everything around them and just looking at the text and not thinking about uh, the conditions under which the, the scholar is working. It, instead, we, we work with uh, proposals that come from usually faculty members and we get into the weeds with them about what, what is life like in their institution? What kind of support are they getting from their administration? Uh, we want to know, is it a doable project? And part of the answer to that question is, are they giving you the time and space to do it? So by the time we make a grant, we, we know pretty well, uh, as much as an outsider can, what it's like to be in the position of that, of that uh, potential grantee. And this goes to a, just a larger point. This sounds a little banal to say it, but I really believe very strongly, and I like to think that's one of the things we do at our foundation, we listen to our grantees. We listen to them when they're prospective grantees, while they have the grant and afterwards. We think of it as a partnership. We don't think of it as we're coming down from on high and telling you what needs to be done. We're trying to learn from you. What do your students need? What does the local community around your institution need? What are the possibilities that you'd like to seize and can we help you do it? So that's a little bit of a fuzzy answer, but um, uh, that's the best. I can do with it right now. Right, so the, let me say something institutional, which may surprise people here, that uh, less resourced institutions ask for less money. So one of the things we discover when we make grants at the Sloan Foundation is that with all respect to Harvard, the folks at Harvard know how to ask for every penny that they could possibly need to support a project. And when you make a grant to Spelman, there's, which we just did recently, it's a wonderful grant. We actually had to have a conversation about, could you ask for a little bit more? Because we think you need a little bit more money to accomplish this. And that resource starvation can put, can create habits where institutions don't ask actually for what they need. And as foundations, we need to be alert for that. We can't just say, hey, it's great that grant's so cheap. We have to come in and make work with institutions to make sure that they're adequately resourced to do the work. And that requires, again, to pick up on, I think, the most important word that we have been saying today, intentionality. We have to be intentional about doing it. Yeah, I want to add to that because I, I think that one of the new policies we just put in place is um, to ask about course loads. And if you're in a high course load institution, we provide an extra course buyout on top of the, the kind of top of the grant amount. That's a tiny little pebble in the ocean of the way inequality plays out in higher ed. But I give that as an example of what you're pointing to, Adam, which is we need to be responsible for thinking about how unequal structures hit our processes and what can we create organizationally, institutionally, in process and policy that helps to, um, to, to level things out 
to the extent that, you know, to, it, even in these, even in these small ways and hopefully in larger ways as well. Another example could be when we think about the indirect costs we pay. We could have policies that allow more indirect costs to institutions that have less resource. You know, there, there are just ways we could think about this in, in, in really different kinds of ways that would be potentially impactful. Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, weigh in here. Thank you, Joy. Um, and actually this is a great, <laughs> great transition um, because I, I just wanted to say something about um, and connect to this question of intentionality and talk about some specifics. So the environment that I work on in, um, and, and, and this conversation kind of bubbled up in a listening session that Joy and I were a part of talking about course buyout and fellowships. So a couple of assumptions. One, that when funders give fellowships, there's a, an assumption that um, scholars are gonna get topped up. That's not always the case. And I don't mean to suggest that that's the case across all universities, but that's certainly not the case at HBCUs, that, that there's always an ability that certainly they wanna do it, but, but they can't necessarily do it. So then we have to ask the question, well, is getting the fellowship, does that cause another level of stress for a scholar trying to produce this work, particularly if it means that there's a move involved to a humanity center of some, some sort. But the other um, issue that came up, and, and again, th th this ties back to the conversation I was in with, with Joy and a group of scholars, was this question of uh, course buyout, which I thought was a wonderful idea. I thought this was great. Um, and one of my colleagues on the call said, well, I, I, I would be hesitant to, to do that because if I can be replaced, if a faculty member can come in and teach my course, then I'm replaceable. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, it's really important for me to be in these listening sessions to understand what my colleagues are, are dealing with across the board and sort of what the environment and the sort of the conversations are and the sensibility is across HBCU environments. So I just wanted to add that um, in this, this sort of conversation about intentionality. Right, and I will echo what uh, what Brandy is saying, and I think the listening sessions are so critical to uncovering, um, you know, everything that we need to be considering, and the cross communication between funders and scholars, and particularly Black scholars at HBCUs is very important. And I think we should certainly be doing more of that. Thank you. Um, and these are great takeaways, I think for many, many of us, uh, certainly at ACLS and, and in our audience as well. Um, let me pick up the, the questions of a couple of uh, people in our audience who uh, essentially an extension of the prior question. They're concerned with how foundations are taking into account uh, academics who come to the academy through untraditional uh, non-traditional paths, um, as well as academics who in an age, and, and ACLS is a, is a player on this field, in an age where attention to emerging scholars, because that's such an easy group to identify as vulnerable, they don't have tenure, they're recently out from the PhD, they have, their networks tend to be thinner or smaller just because they haven't been uh, around to build relationships as long. So how, along with people who get into the academy from uh, in non-traditional paths, how are we uh, attending to the needs and aspirations of senior scholars of color who um, may have not, who, who aren't eligible for, for uh, programs aimed at emerging scholars, but who find themselves really without, uh, without adequate resources, uh, without access? Are there thoughts about um, support um, or, or how, again, how are you taking these, these groups and other comparable groups into account in your thinking? Or how might, for the scholars and administrators on the panel, how are you finding uh, effective ways to get their voices to be heard? I've now said a couple of times, I won't repeat it. I'm a little bit at a disadvantage in answering a question like that because we don't direct our resources immediately to scholars. But let me offer one general observation about something we're trying to do with the broader question in mind of trying to sustain and indeed help uh, ensure the survival of humanistic scholarship, broadly speaking. Um, we are all aware uh, that uh, undergraduate students, and this goes from the elite institutions to the community colleges and every kind of institution in between, undergraduate students are fleeing from the humanities. And we can wring our hands about that and we can lament it and we can 
place blame for it in all kinds of different quarters, but it's a fact of life. So if we're interested in a sustaining humanistic scholarship uh, for the future, I think we have to find new ways to connect humanistic scholars with undergraduate students outside the shrinking disciplinary majors. So one of the things we believe in strongly at the Teagle Foundation is the importance of revitalizing general education and supporting young scholars in such a way that they will have the space to commit themselves to teaching non-specialist students, which is a particular, requires a particular kind of orientation or set of skills that are not necessarily those that you acquire in graduate school. So that's one broad way in which we are thinking about the future of scholarship uh, and we're hopeful that that will make a contribution to sustaining what we all believe in. Thank you, Andy. I, and I'm, your, uh, your comments are opening up to another question um, in, in the Q&A, in, in the chat, so to speak, that we can see that, uh, that acknowledges that we've, we're finding ourselves with a, um, in the middle of, a, of, of what the questioner calls a deep multi-layered crisis. And, but it is not to, and I'm sure she's just as sensitive to this, not, not to, to repeat the cliche, but it is also opening up opportunities. And we've just gone through a year of reinvention for ourselves, um, some uh, revealing some positive paths um, and experiences that we didn't expect, um, revealing, as, as many of you have said, um, inequalities and inequities as well. So how can we seize this moment what can um, can institutions do uh, in in their sphere within their world, and what can foundations do? Uh, what are the first steps to uh, to create or make the most of the opportunities we see in front of us? And I would love to, because of a mistake made by ACLS in, in scheduling and communication, I would love to invite Naila to speak because I know she has to leave a little bit early. Not to put the spotlight on you unfairly, Naila. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's a tough question. I mean, I think that, and, and perhaps the answer is, is for all of us across sectors and across organizations and across roles, which is to allow ourselves to be in a space of creating something new. I think one of the powerful things about the reinvention we've seen is that all the rules that we thought we had to stick to all of a sudden got all thrown out the window. My, you know, my, my kids are in the room next door in school, right? Like, and so everybody, all of the things, all of the boundaries and ways of doing things that we thought were immovable are not. So if we can just hold that spirit, it's very much what Dwight was saying a bit earlier. If we can just hold that spirit that some of the things we think aren't changeable or aren't movable actually are changeable and are movable, then what can, how can we create a new holding holding that um that essence i i couldn't agree more and i i just i would only add to uh to what naila has just said um is it's this is a time also to be bold um and that's and i don't say that lightly um it's not something that the academy is known for um and you know change usually happens quite incrementally and as much as there are many innovative and exciting thinkers in the academy. We don't always do well with uh, change as, uh, as, a, as a general matter either. But I do think it would be irresponsible to history, to this moment, and to the institutions and uh, the institutions we represent and their long-term sustainability for us not to be courageous in these moments, in this moment, in terms of imagining what are the new opportunities that have come out of this incredibly grand forced experiment that we've all gone through. So I just, I, I would really caution all of us to, to find that place, that center from which to, to really think in bold and courageous ways about our work and its future. Adam, please. I would just want to add one thing to that. I agree very much. And I think it's very important that our narrative be one of possibility and not one of defensiveness. That is, there's a, there's a way of thinking about this that, oh my God, we're under threat. The human, all of the, everything other than STEM is, is gonna take over the university. And we, we, we have to kind of act out of this sense of fear and impending doom. And I, I think we should be acting out of a sense of possibility. That is, I think what is opened up is new ways of doing scholarship, 
new ways for the humanistic scholars, the humanistic fields to speak to our current moment, not because they're only relevant if they do so, but because they're needed, <laughs> right? And I think that, that we often fall into a narrative of impending doom. And I, I think that doesn't motivate people. It, it makes people actually hunker down within the ways that they've already been doing things and, and, and put the sheets over their head. And I think we need to do just the opposite. And I think foundations actually, which can be as conservative as university faculty <laughs> about what they're willing to fund and how they're willing to engage with us. Foundations have to do the same thing. They have to be out there funding really new ways of thinking, things that are scary to their boards. And that really takes some explanation, uh, but that, that speak to possibilities of the future. And that, that isn't easy to do, but I think we, we all need to do that together. Let me just say, no, no reasonable person, I think, <clears throat> could disagree with either of the preceding comments. We all want to look at the possibilities and stay away from the doom and gloom rhetoric, and I couldn't agree more. But I do think it's important to be realistic about the world in which we're operating. Uh, as much as nobody can really predict what the post-pandemic world will look like, we already know, for example, that there is a surge in applications to the elite selective institutions. Uh, whereas the smaller fragile liberal arts colleges, community colleges have already seen a drop in enrollment. HBCUs are facing unique challenges, though I'm hopeful that uh, philanthropy is waking up and paying attention to them in a new way. Um, but you know what I'm suggesting, and we all know this, Different institutions are, 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 are positioned in different ways in terms of their ability to take advantage of these opportunities, to think uh, boldly. To think boldly, you gotta have some resources. And uh, so we should keep that in mind as we think about how to distribute our resources uh, broadly, uh, broadly speaking. So Andrew, I mean, I, I wanna, one, I take your point, but I also wanna quibble a little bit with, uh, because I, do, I actually believe that there's an opportunity for across the spectrum for us to think in new and innovative ways. Um, and then, I mean, I say this as, a, as someone who has been uh, both at very well healed institutions and someone who has been at very um, um, uh, tuition dependent institutions. Um, and I think opportunity um, is also possible even in the most resource constrained context. It doesn't look the same way always. And how you go about it has to be different sometimes. And it sometimes also means that you have to be willing in those more resource constrained environments um, to make some harder choices. But I, I, I resist the, the, um, the notion that, that because I'm in a more resource constrained environment, that I can't dream um, uh, and be and be bold about what is possible in my context. But to your point, I, I do think it is important to understand our context and uh, and the kinds of parameters that that places on us. Look, I I fully agree, and you know it's often said, but I think it's true. The uh, community colleges, for instance, are very innovative. Uh, they have to be uh, improv <laughs> improvisational. Yeah creative institutions. And the, and the big, endow, big endowed institutions are often very slow to think that they're doing anything wrong and they need to do anything new. That's absolutely true. But it's also true that what, 80% of the faculty at community colleges are on contingent contracts. And how much can you ask of somebody who's holding down two jobs, three jobs on two or three different campuses, how much can you ask that person to throw themselves into a new project at one of those campuses in the hope that they'll be rehired next year. I mean, there are some on the ground realities that we need to be, I mean, we all are aware of them, but we need to take them seriously into account as we look at the future. And obviously it's my hope that those realities will change. That requires a shift in public policy, a shift in public sentiment. Uh, and none of us has the, has the power to do that on our own, but maybe collaboratively we can make some headway. I would lean into that, that actually collaboratively, we have quite a bit of power to help push in the directions of change that we wanna see. And in fact, you know, I, I, I'm a black person in this country. My ancestors dreamed of freedom when someone would have said that's not realistic. And so how do we hold a vision that we can't see and then really fight 
in all of the spheres of influence that we have to make that vision a reality. So I think that there's a, there's a way in which we have to hold the responsibility for that ourselves, especially those of us in the foundation community, because not only do we have wealth at our disposal, and no, it's not infinite, but it is wealth, we also have the attention of policymakers. We can spend the time and energy to galvanize communities. Like we are tremendously powerful about pushing for the kinds of change that we'd like to see. Not all powerful, but, but I think we have to see ourselves as, as all of us as really um, important actors and then step into the responsibility that that requires of us. And I think that means thinking differently about our sector of higher ed uh, too. I mean, that is, if I'm only thinking about um, in, in, you know, in, in the narrowest sense, how the new school wins, right? Um, I'm not sure that that is going to be either long-term the, uh, uh, the best in terms of seeking opportunities for the new school or for the kind of neighbors, partners, potential collaborators that are going to, I think, be an important part of our future. I think that we have to begin to think about the health of our sector. And I think that's the point you're making, Andrew, too. Um, and as we think about that, I think the future really is going to be, to, to, not, to Naila's point, really leaning more into um, strategic partnerships, um, thoughtful ways of working with neighboring institutions, using this extremely powerful platform that we've all been now forced into uh, of Zoom and, um, and online and video, et cetera, um, using that and leveraging that um, in terms of helping to achieve greater access to the things that we do have on offer. Um, and so I, I do think there's, there's something there um, to thinking more broadly about the sector and not just about our own individual insti institutional uh, health. I couldn't agree more. I could be slightly personal for one 30 seconds. When I took this job, I was quoted somewhere or other as saying, private institutions have public responsibilities. Absolutely. And we know, I mean, you know, where do those endowments come from to uh, President Nasir's point? These are tax deductible contributions. Uh, the, the institutions don't pay taxes. So, so their wealth comes out of the public treasury. They have public responsibilities and they have not been meeting them adequately. They need to rethink their relationship to their local community and the broader community beyond the welfare of the, the students who have the good fortune to get inside the gates. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't start to happen, if it continues to be a competitive, my endowment is bigger than yours and my selectivity rate is lower than yours, we're in a lot of trouble. So that has to stop. And if we can do something to turn that around, that would be very valuable, I think. Can I just, uh, I mean, going to the public question, I also think we have to acknowledge that there's culture bearers and knowledge producers in the communities around us. And that is a very valuable resource and institutions have not been very good at figuring out ways to compensate those folks who are outside of our institutions, but are really important resources for our institutions and our students and our faculty, uh, not as subjects, objects of research, but as subjects of knowledge production. And I think looking to those bold ideas, we have to look in that direction as well. Absolutely. I certainly agree. And what we've heard today, particularly from our funders, is very encouraging. And so um, I would just sort of echo uh, what's been said already that um, as funding agencies look to be disruptive, right, in, in a sense in what they, they are uh, planning and that way of inching forward, that that all happens within the context of this um, communication and uh, cross collaboration of the input from black scholars um, who we're you know, reaching out to today in terms of this conversation, uh, in terms of what we need to know from black scholars if we are to continue to, uh, to move toward lifting up uh, funding opportunities for them and uh, the unique voices that may have been missed in, in the past by, by not having um, new ways of thinking about this in place. 
I know we're coming up on 5.30 and we have a hard stop at that time. So I want to uh, turn in, in what's probably going to be the last round of discussion to, um, to acknowledge and thank our global participants for joining us. We have a number of people um, who have identified in their questions as coming from um, uh, from various countries in Africa, or working in African uh, higher institutions of higher education, and who are seeking um, uh, information about networking. And, and it seems to me to link right to the question, another question uh, in the Q&A about how to think, what, what do we mean when we're talking about thinking boldly and concretely speaking in terms of, uh, of the proposals and ideas and new approaches uh, to scholarship that um, that we want to fund or support wherever we sit, um, how might that incorporate international collaboration, and and how uh, how can we engage, particularly uh, relationships among Black scholars in the working in the United States? And to answer another question, I would say that when we when we titled this panel Black Scholars, we were thinking of African American scholars, also Black scholars working in the U.S. Um, and uh, and so thinking about Black scholars interacting across uh, the continent of Africa, acro across North America, um, it seems to, to me that this is a productive way to think about, uh, about bold work and new collaborations. And, uh, but that I, I'd like to open it up for comments about, about the international context and new possibilities wherever you sit, you see there. I'm, I'm happy to take, a, take the, first, uh, <laughs> the first stab at it. Um, I, I think it's really important, um, and certainly in the field I, uh, I come from and I claim, and that is African American studies. Um, uh, for me, my own maturation um, as a scholar um, really came um, primarily through both its transdisciplinarity, but also its decentering, if you will, of the US in the context of the African diaspora and how you how we approach um, African American studies as a discipline in that regard. So I my frame is one that uh, uh, that does not uh, exclude um, blacks um, uh, in Africa or elsewhere for that matter. Um, and I think institu institutionally um, there are ways to be responsible to that and responsive to that both in terms of the makeup of a faculty, uh, in terms of a curriculum, uh, in terms of um, how you prepare PhD students um, for, um, for the market, all of those things uh, for me uh, in, in an institutional context are critically important in some ways the decentering of the US so that it's not that what we do and people like me who study the blacks in the US context, that's not unimportant, but it's also um, understood as in context and in conversation with the experience of Black people elsewhere in the world. I'd also just add, Joy, that, you know, for me, um, one of the things as we think about that future, that bold future, I think it was um, Adam who talked about, the, or maybe it was Andrew, I'm, um, I, I'm, I'm getting a little confused, uh, who talked about this earlier, uh, and that is the idea of um, the humanities and the work that we do and the importance of translating that work. Um, and that's not to say, which I think was also said earlier, that the study of ideas for the sake of studying ideas is still I, I, something I will defend until my dying breath. But I do think we live in a moment where we need what the humanities especially have to offer. I think that we are in a moment um, to go back to what one of the questioners said, um, with the series of crises that we've experienced over the course of the last year. We're in a moment, in the last four years even, we're in a moment where we need to rebuild the muscles of what it is to be a mature democracy, right? We are in a moment where we need to rebuild the public square and civil discourse. And I think universities have an incredibly important role to play because historically we've been places that are committed to things like truth, right? Things like knowledge, those old saws that you know seem uh, quaint today. I think a return to some of that and a full-throated defense of that, insisting on things like facts, right? Um, as, a, uh, as a launching point from which to have 
real discussion and discussion that is not about winners and losers, which is how our politics have devolved, um, but uh, discussions that are about coming to greater understanding, right? Uh, because if we don't, if we're not really, if the, uh, if the point of arguing isn't to better understand each other, then I do really worry about um, our, our, our ability to rebuild a kind of functioning public square uh, from which uh, we can uh, really have a thriving democracy. And I think that is something that universities know how to do, hard conversations where people have the same set of facts and can disagree, but come to try and understand each other. I think that's something we can model for the world. I have a one word comment on that. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Dean Gilbert, Dari, you were going to weigh in? Uh, actually, not. I think um, Dwight uh, certainly summed it up and uh, amen again. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are coming up on the witching hour uh, of 5.30, our hard stop. I, I want to say in closing, um, just a sincere thank you to uh, all of our panelists. I, I know I, this is such a cliche to say, but it's really true. I know I could listen to you for another hour and, and hear more from, from all of you. Um, I also want to express gratitude to the, the many, many questioners um, who asked questions that we didn't have time to get to. We are going to, uh, to preserve some of those questions as, or those questions as part of our record and, uh, and share them with our panelists. We, we can't promise answers, I'm afraid, but, um, but we can promise that we're gonna take your concerns uh, and questions and priorities and aspirations and dreams into account as we go back and do our work. So, um, so a hearty thank you to all um, and I wish you all a healthy and happy rest of 2021. I look forward to being in touch with all of you panelists, distinguished panelists again. And Rick, one final thank you to you for moderating. Everyone have a good evening. <laughs>